Okay, so we, um, I think, are familiar at this point uh, with kind of the inpatient education sessions that Lash and I are doing. Um, here's a schedule of the upcoming sessions. This month is March, so we're going to be talking primarily about insulin drip management in the hospital. In April and May, we'll kind of focus back on um, management of emergent hypertension or severe range hypertension. I'm including antihypertensives and magnesium. Um, just wanted to circle back to review um, Lash's learning points from February session. Um, just a reminder um, that we're defining hypertension in pregnancy at a blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 systolic um, over 90 diastolic and consider severe range blood pressures at 160 over 110. There is um, are some guidelines that look at kind of delineating between mild and moderate range hypertension, um, but we primarily are thinking about um, severe hypertension when we're thinking about treatment. Um, hypertension, especially severe hypertension at the time of delivery is uh, associated with adverse perinatal and maternal outcomes, including stroke, postpartum hemorrhage, abruption, and others that you see there. Um, and then the protocol that Lashika started to review in February um, was surrounding um, a MUSE page for um, severe range blood pressures in which someone will be paged if there's initial blood pressure that is greater than or equal to 160 over 110, either systolic or diastolic, with the plan to repeat a blood pressure in 15 minutes while optimizing scenarios for optimal blood pressure management, including the cuff size, et cetera. Um, the goal of the MUSE page is to notify a provider and um, make sure that medications are ordered if appropriate within 30 to 60 minutes of that initial documented severe range blood pressure. And options for medications include IV labetalol or hydralazine or PO nifedipine immediate release, all of which are found in an order set, which we'll go over at the next session. Um, and then also um, plan would be to start magnesium for seizure prophylaxis, which we all know is not an antihypertensive. Um, so Lash will go over more of the logistics of those in April and May. Um, so we'll turn back to gestational diabetes and the objectives for today. Um, we At the last session, we talked a little bit about some of the kind of current existing literature and briefly reviewed existing hospital protocols. We'll return to that today um, in the context of looking at the order sets that Meritor has. Um, so I've tried to kind of um, link those together in a way that makes sense. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about um, documentation, which is fairly simple for this as well. Um, so just a note on admissions, when someone is admitted, um, let's say who has A2GDM, um, the goal is to not order their insulin or PO meds because we're going to be um, monitoring their blood sugar more closely and uh, treating any hyperglycemia with IV insulin. Um, if there's an induction, I feel like I've most commonly seen that they'll um, take their last home dose prior to admission off in the evening before and do a, a fasting morning admission, though that's not necessarily um, anything that's written in the guidelines at all that I can find from Meritor. Um, just a reminder that medication reconciliation is important for anything that someone's taking prior to admission. I feel like the residents sometimes just go into the order sets and place the orders for what they know is happening in terms of the admission, but just a reminder to them to discontinue medications or not, or continue certain medications if they need to. Um, the current diet guidance in the Meritor um, protocol is that an early labor that a patient can be in taking regular diet or clears, and as labor progresses, they do not give any sort of threshold of active labor or not. Um, they do recommend a transition to clears or ice chips. Um, and as soon as someone is on an insulin drip, they recommend that someone be NPO, except ice chips or clear liquids without any carbohydrates. So no additional carbs for um, these folks. And, and that is the kind of current guidance from Meritor. Um, the order set that we'll be going over um, and is the order set that should be placed on admission is called OB Labor Diabetes Management Focused Alternative, which is a lot of words. Um, but basically, if you search OB and diabetes, this is the only one that comes up. I know that Sarah Nat, um, who is the primary OB pharmacist, has a lot of like preferred um, order sets that we have kind of steal and favorite, um, she does not have a preferred order set for diabetes management. So if you just search um, broadly, the one that comes up is the one that you should um, steal and add to your favorites. 
Um, so current protocol from Meritor recommends the following for blood sugar check timing in early labor. If the patient is still eating, they recommend doing fasting in two hour postprandial, much akin to what they would most likely have been doing at home with a goal blood sugar of 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Um, as they progress, perhaps in early labor and decide not to eat or to transition to a clear liquid diet, or perhaps if they've had to get an epidural and that's um, when that transition happens, um, blood sugar check should be done every two hours with a goal of 70 to 110. Um, and then when a patient is in active labor um, or whenever someone has chosen to initiate an insulin drip, the blood sugars are checked hourly with a goal again of 70 to 110. Um, so I, yeah, let's talk about this. I, this might be a little bit out of order. Hopefully it's not. Um, so this is the initial part of the order set for the OB labor diabetes management focused alternative order set. Um, I have kind of taken a bunch of screenshots here and the things that are auto populated with a check will show a check mark. So I'll note when that is. It's important to note that the um, order set does not come with the glucose checks automatically checked off. So someone will have to intentionally do that. There's options here to either check every hour, which again with, would often be with insulin infusion or during active labor, or to do the fasting in uh, two hours postprandial. Um, so those are options that are kind of in here. But I've often seen um, other folks do is kind of click on one of the point of care glucose um, orders and then change the timing to say every two hours. And then they put a little note into nursing that says, check hourly during active labor. Um, but often I would find that the nurses still are kind of just getting the alert that's to check it every two hours. So it might be important to intentionally make a change in that order to go from Q2 hours to hourly whenever you decide to make that change, just so that that alert pops up for the nurses on a regular basis, as opposed to just being in the comments. Um, and I would say there's also some variability in practice between providers. So it's it's just, I think, a better thing to kind of communicate with the nurses um, always just because they see varying things. Um, insulin initiation, just as a review, the gold blood sugars per meritor, we talked about this already, are generally 70 to 110, um, though in early labor, if they're eating, it can be 70 to 120. We talked at the last session that there's some kind of mixed guidance and mixed literature out there um, in terms of supporting these guidelines and um, to prevent neonatal hypoglycemia. Um, ACOG's current guidance is an intrapartum blood sugar goal less than 110 for pregestational diabetes, but no RECs for GDM. But we think that that has been extrapolated to create the goals that Meritor is following for patients who have both gestational and pregestational diabetes. Um, and knowing that some other um, societies recommend more liberal goals. Um, but generally, we're starting IV insulin um, when a blood sugar is greater than 110 and a patient is not eating and stopping it at delivery. We know that blood sugar check should be checked hourly once the insulin drip is started. And that again is all driven by a nursing protocol, which we'll show, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and there can be some nuance and provider discretion surrounding um, insulin initiation. If a patient has received steroids, most likely they will continue to be hyperglycemic, um, but just know that that's something that could be um, elevating their blood sugar. Terbutaline can temporarily elevate blood sugar as well. And then, um, you know, the the guidance currently is to initiate IV insulin whenever a patient is no longer eating and their blood sugar is greater than 110. So I think that's where that kind of clears without carbohydrate diet um, comes from is that if there's a modifiable thing, which is that they've been drinking sugary juice all the time throughout their labor, um, perhaps we could just take that away as opposed to having to start insulin for a blood sugar that is being elevated by ongoing PO intake of carbs. Um, so moving on to the order set and how you would order IV insulin drip, um, the kind of upper part here is for bolus and basal insulin, which we're really not going to be dealing with. Um, the kind of part below is the obstetric insulin infusion, um, and that first option there is the one that you would click on if you wanted to initiate an um, IV insulin drip. Um, it's noted here that this should not be used for patients who are um, in DK DKA, and I think that um, obviously if we were worried about DKA in a patient, this would be a, a different conversation. So this is for your standard patient with gestational diabetes who is not in DKA, um, which ideally, I, I don't think it's possible for them to be in DKA, um, most likely. So um, you do have to check that. So note it does not come auto-populated. Um, this is what it looks like if you do check it. So it just um, is a unit between 0 to 10. Um, and it says to titrate per hospital protocol, which we will review right now. 
So this is the nursing protocol um, for insulin drips. It's just, I think this is not something that we necessarily need to memorize, but something we just should be familiar that this is what the nurses are following in order to guide the rate at which they um, initiate and, and change insulin um, dosing as a person progresses through labor. So um, they are starting at one unit, I believe, um, a, a rate of one unit per hour. And um, so basically they're kind of, when they check an hour later after initiating insulin, they're checking the current blood sugar and then also relative to the prior. So if the current blood sugar decreases by less than 50 milligrams per deciliter from the prior check, then they're, you're looking at the first column. I don't know if people can see my mouse at all. Maybe there's this pointer thing. Ooh, there we go. Maybe people can see this. Um, so you would be in this first column and basically if their blood sugar still is in the 70 to 110 range that they wouldn't change the infusion rate if it's higher than that range then they would increase the infusion rate by a certain amount based on um, the current blood sugar um, let's say that instead the more recent blood sugar check has dropped by greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter from the last blood sugar check, then they might be a little bit more cautious and they might decrease the infusion rate if the blood sugar is at goal or they might maintain the infusion rate even if the blood sugar is higher. I think the goal with that is not to overcorrect and to risk hypoglycemia, excuse me. Um, but so again, I don't think this is something we need to memorize at all. This is easily found on any of the um, Meritor uh, intranet hospital protocols. And I also um, emailed this to you all, um, or Ali emailed this to you all with the uh, notes from the January meeting. But I think it's important to kind of at least know how the nurses are um, changing things. Um, and they do talk a little bit about um, hypoglycemia management, which we'll talk about in a second. But basically, if someone is hypoglycemic, we are stopping the insulin infusion, um, giving a bolus of dextrose, and then rechecking in 15 minutes. And there's also other options for management of hypoglycemia, which we'll talk about. Um, so hypoglycemia. So the goal that Meritor um, has outlined is to treat at a blood sugar less than 70 or if a patient is symptomatic. Um, options for treatment of hypoglycemia include 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrate PO. We'll show kind of the suggestions that they have for that in the order set. Um, that IV dextrose bolus that is mentioned in the um, prior slide, the 300 mLs of, of D5 and normal saline IV. Um, they also have an option for glucagon um, within the order set. Then we will, I'm going to take off this pointer, it's a little obnoxious. Um, the, plan is to recheck the blood sugar in 15 minutes, and you can repeat that treatment for three cycles um, prior to notifying a provider, though often I think the nurses would, would notify you sooner than that. The goal is to obtain blood sugar greater than 80, um, and that kind of can then resume kind of normal management of, of their blood sugars at that time. I think it's important to remember that if someone is symptomatic from their blood sugar, um, or if we're worried about symptomatic hypoglycemia on the labor floor, that we should just kind of make sure to keep a differential broad. Um, certainly, if someone's hypoglycemic, that can explain a lot of things like nausea and someone maybe not kind of responding as they normally would. But there's other reasons that people can feel nauseous and um, and feel unwell on the labor floor. So just remember to repeat a blood sugar check or blood pressure check, or repeat an exam, consider labs if you're at all concerned about other etiologies. Um, just remembering that hypoglycemia certainly could be the cause, but there might be other um, processes at play as well. Um, and then just a reminder that the nursing protocol currently is to stop the insulin drip at delivery, but there certainly could be a risk if that drip were to continue um, for someone to become hypoglycemic. So it's always good practice to discuss this intentionally with the nurse and the patient so that everyone knows that as soon as baby is delivered that we plan to um, stop the, blood, the insulin drip. And this is what the order set looks like. Um, it does come auto-populated with these um, uh, hypoglycemia management options. So includes kind of a reminder to the nursing staff about sympt potential symptoms of hypoglycemia um, and to notify the physician, the physician about that. And then they have um, auto-populated this option for carb choices if someone has a blood sugar less than 70. They're really kind of strict here about giving someone only a half cup of regular soda pop um, to treat their hypoglycemia of uh, less than 70. And I, I would say at that time, I, I might feel more inclined to let them have a whole cup of, of soda. Um, but this is the current guidance that they have. And I think that's something that can 
um, it's at least there so that the nurses can give a, a pre-described amount that we know, um, we generally know the carbohydrate content uh, for to a patient. Um, but I, again, if someone is symptomatic, I, I think I would err on the side of wanting them to feel better sooner rather than later. Um, and then the um, other options to check off, do these are not auto-populated, so you would have to check them yourselves, um, include glucagon, one milligram IV, and then um, if they certainly, then you want to also check the blood sugar again 15 minutes after glucose or glucagon administration. And so I probably would defer to just clicking both of these automatically just so that that order is there. I, I imagine they have some of this on the floor, but just so nothing has to be kind of pre-approved from an order standpoint prior to um, uh, someone, you know, prior to the emergent situation arising. Does anyone have questions before I move on briefly? I don't have a ton more to talk about. Anyone have questions briefly about the order set? Okay, cool. We will move on. It's fairly straightforward and it's all nursing driven. Um, so documentation is, is pretty straightforward as well, but I think it's just important to remind residents and remind ourselves that we should just intentionally document that we are thinking about this and managing this um, in the course of someone's um, labor. So um, in either the HMP or the progress notes, it's important to, uh, for, to kind of give some homage to what the blood sugar readings are. So either saying that we review the blood sugar trend and it's all at goal or, you know, recording the last three to four blood sugar checks, something along those lines, something to say that um, this is something that we're reviewing and managing. Um, and then adding um, GDM to the assessment and plan along with things like labor and fetal status, you know, the, the normal things that we have in our an assessment and plan, just making sure that we acknowledge what our current assessment is and what the current plan is. So blood sugars are currently at goal, no intervention planned. Um, or blood sugars, you know, recently complicated by hyperglycemia, we're initiating insulin for blood sugar goal less than 110 per protocol. It doesn't have to be anything big. We know that this is primarily nursing driven, but just at least making sure that we're kind of saying at, at what phase of monitoring we're in and whether we're intervening or not. Um, I think it's also important to try to intentionally list um, GDM in the EPIC problem list for admission. That's just a kind of reminder um, to both like pharmacy and nursing that this is a problem that the patient has, um, is being monitored for during their hospital stay. Um, and then postpartum blood sugar checks really seem to be per the discretion of the provider. I have seen a lot of folks do a fasting um, postpartum blood sugar on postpartum day one. The Meritor protocol suggests a capillary blood sugar like an hour after the insulin drip is turned off. I, I think in general, most patients, even if they're A2 GDM, uh, you know, we're going to have a hard time uh, justifying continuing any ongoing pharmacologic management of, of their blood sugars and the time between delivery and six weeks postpartum whenever they'll have an ongoing follow-up um, for whether or not they have any um, um, ongoing risk of type 2 diabetes. So I just find that, you know, the blood sugar checks might be informative in some sense, but may not change management. Just know that that's something that is um, kind of variably practiced and there's not a ton of clear guidance in the Meritor um, guidelines currently about checking blood sugars postpartum. Um, and then um, just making sure that we mentioned in the discharge summary that this was something that was an active um, problem during this patient's pregnancy and that we have some degree of a follow-up plan and discharge summary just so that um, that's documented. And that is kind of all the learning that I have for today. Um, so the next steps, um, so I am kind of finalizing this case-based quiz. I'm just gonna touch base with Ali and Lashika real fast prior to kind of making sure that that gets distributed. But the goal with the case-based quiz is to essentially go through a labor admission and um, be able to put this order set into practice and just know the ins and outs of management of um, intrapartum insulin drip, um, which is relatively straightforward, I think, for the most part, but certainly just good to kind of put that into practice. Resources to review, which we've already discussed, would be the slides and or recordings from both of the sessions, um, both this session and the one in January. Um, we did send out the Meritor Hospital protocols and certainly can again, and I did try to highlight those with things that were pertinent to us so that, that you don't have to kind of go through um, oodles of, of information that is not applicable. 
Um, there were some articles that we discussed in the prior session, and then also ACOG practice bulletins on GDM and pregestational diabetes, um, which are you know available for your perusal as well. And that is it. Thank you so much. If anyone has any questions or um, discussion, I'm happy to um, to be here and to chat. Alisa, I'm sorry, I didn't want to in interrupt you, but in the orders that you have for the insulin, there were a couple of other things in there. Something about insulin, like like protocol or something, almost like when you order preeclampsia labs, that the insulin pump panel and the nursing communication, do we need to do anything about that? No, those are solely for patients who are have type 1 diabetes and have an insulin pump that they've used at home prior to the hospitalization. So. Um, the insulin pump panel, uh, that's solely for patients who are transitioning to back to a home insulin pump. Um, and I, since we're not managing any pregestational type 1 diabetes at this time, um, that is not something that's currently relevant to us. And I would say similar to, uh, similarly, the basal and bolus um, insulin is not something that we are would currently apply to the labor admission for gestational diabetes. Thank you, and this was great. Thanks. Um, hey, Alyssa, it's Serena. I agree. This was really helpful. So here is a scenario. I'm just wondering how you would manage this because this happens. You know, somebody who's um, has either diet controlled or um, is on oral medicine comes in in early labor, has a blood sugar of 126. Um, how would you approach that? Yeah. So um, I do think that. The current guide, so the Meritor recommendations do have something, there's a, a phrase in it and I wish I could remember it, but it says something like, these are general recommendations or these are, they use something that's a little wishy-washy and to me is interpreted as that there's some nuance here. And so what I've seen many folks do is that they will um, see if there's anything modifiable um, prior to initiating insulin. So early labor, above, which where we know there's going to be um, some more time to essentially make this patient NPO and restrict their intake to the point where they uh, their blood sugar will probably normalize. Um, I would, in, in my mind, I would maybe recheck that if they're in early labor. Um, I would potentially make them clear, maybe not totally restrict all their PO intake, but have a frank discussion with the patient. Um, and then maybe recheck in two hours, I've seen some people recheck in four hours, um, even if they are taking some degree of PO, just to kind of see where their blood sugar trend goes, as opposed to doing a fasting and postprandial um, situation. So I would probably repeat in, um, in two hours would be my guess and um, have a frank discussion with the patient about the balance that we need to strike and uh, trying to modify some of their PO intake um, in order to try to avoid IV insulin if we can, but knowing that it's an an option that's recommended and available to us should we need that tool later on during their labor process. So that's what I would do. I don't know if that's again. It, no, it, I mean, that's it's happened several times and that's what we did end up doing. And thankfully the repeat blood sugars were um, under 110, even though, you know, I think that as you know, there's not a lot of evidence for 110, um, I think probably General. 120 is probably fine. But um, anyway, thank you. Sounds yeah. Cool. yeah, I think I, I've seen that same nuance and that same kind of waiting it out from the side of OB from my work with them this year. So I think that's kind of the unofficial practice currently. Um, I think the one thing that's important to know while that we did kind of review that guidance that there's maybe not a ton of evidence that this 110 goal is even something that um, is it's, there's not a ton of evidence to support that goal necessarily, but should we be initiating the insulin drip at any time, just knowing that the nursing protocol is so driven by those ranges and so driven by the goal of 110 being kind of the top. So I think as soon as we start the, ins the IV insulin drip part of this, you do go down that pathway of keeping someone to the 70 to 110 goal and that um, asking the nurse to kind of change how they would titrate the insulin drip is uh, probably not appropriate. So I would say that nuance kind of exists prior to initiating the insulin drip, but once we initiate the insulin drip, we really should be managing it based on the protocol. Hi, Ellie, this is Lee, and uh, I would echo really outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would also second that advice you just had based on my experience in fellowship. I learned a um, certain 
protocol for insulin drip. And then I got to uh, Sinai Hospital in, in Milwaukee and tried to implement what I had learned, which was different than the hospital protocol and quickly learned it's much easier to just go with the local protocol and, and uh, uh, would, would uh, recommend that. Um, I, could, could you uh, review for us recommendations for IV glucose? Is it 150 below 150 you start B uh, 5 Yeah, so the current protocol that I've, that I'm familiar with from reviewing Meritor's um, guidance is that they're really only initiating any sort of IV dextrose for patients who have type one pregestational diabetes um, and that um, or in our cases, what would apply to us is thinking about a dextrose infusion really as a hypoglycemia management protocol um, only. So this kind of nursing protocol here at less than 70, they recommend giving that 300 ml bolus of D5 and normal saline. But otherwise, there is no current um, guidance specifically about giving any sort of dextrose in IV fluids or any particular IV fluids as a management of blood sugars for patients with GDM. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of literature and varying protocols out there that use varying um, IV uh, fluids to kind of help manage uh, blood sugars in labor, but that is not a current thing that's set in stone um, or protocolized at Meritor um, for patients with GDM. Yeah, I've yeah. seen it um, in some protocols below 150, just with the idea of someone's in a, a long labor needs some energy, you know. Um, uh, uh, and then on the flip side, um, in terms of the recommendation for clears, uh, I often um, discourage uh, fruit juice uh, just because you can get that, that can give you a pretty decent bolus um, of sugar uh, that can kind of make the yeah. sugar man management um, kind of challenging. And I would say, I think, um, yeah, and I, as far as I know, the kind of fluids, you know, I, I think maybe that's also why they don't kind of just automatically give any sort of dextrose and fluids and um, I, I think, I don't know, I, I kind of feel a little bit torn that, yeah, some people should have some degree of energy intake prior to a very taxing physical event. I mean, that seems the equivalent of running a marathon. But um, I think if we were interested in um, making sure that someone had some degree of intake and weren't interested in doing it in an IV form, I think perhaps this like um, guidance that's in the hypoglycemia management might be helpful to kind of say like, I know that I'm giving someone a 15 gram uh, PO intake of these carbohydrates by giving them a half cup of regular soda pop. So, um, you know, we might be able to follow some of these orders um, if we wanted to allow someone some degree of PO intake to maintain um, blood sugar, maintain energy in some capacity, but also quantify it in a way that maybe um, didn't kind of let the patient go totally ad lib um, if we were concerned about the converse with hyper hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. And then um, I would just say, uh, um, document encourage that we document estimated fetal weight, um, whether it's ultrasound or clinical, um, uh, at the beginning of labor. Um, sometimes, you know, there there is the. Increased risk of shoulder dystocia. And it, if that did come up, I think it's helpful to have documented what you were thinking from the start. I agree that I would say all the other complications that come along with uh, GDM, we should be anticipating as well and documenting or kind of, you know, talking about on board rounds. This is Lou. I think we should be documenting uh, routinely. Uh, position, you know, OP versus OA uh, with ultrasound in, you know, at some stage of labor. I, I keep reminding residents that we can do that. Even now, the handheld ultrasounds, the newer ones, you know, are, uh, you know, pretty accurate for doing that. So I think that, you know, one of the comp you know big complications of delivering a large baby is delivering a large baby OP. So uh, I think we need to do more of that. 
I think I've seen some mention um, of Luther Gaston um, doing kind of a study about uh, like transperineal ultrasound, perhaps for assessment of um, position um, during second stage of labor. So I, I don't know if that's going to be extended to kind of uh, consent to our patients, but just as an awareness there that there's some kind of ongoing study that's happening. Yeah. In there. You, you don't need a transperineal ultrasound to figure out position. That, that, that's fair. That's fair. But I know that that's something that they're kind of emphasizing on their end. Yeah, and I was, particularly when you get to that point of a uh, long second stage um, before you think about um, the OR or vacuum, uh, just throwing the ultrasound. If the eyes are looking up at you, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty easy to, to uh, determine position then and consider a manual rotation, which can make a big difference. And then I've gotten in the habit also of always or almost always throwing on a ultrasound for position before putting the vacuum on since it's important to know which and and uh, despite all the experience I've had uh, uh, determining position uh, on exam without it's nowhere near as reliable as the ultrasound. <laughs> 